Um, I'm just going to make sure we're recorded here. There we go. Um, uh, yeah, so this webinar is in planning a CSA program. Uh, my name is Emily, and I'm the engagement coordinator with Farm Folk City Folk, uh, where we work to connect, empower, and inspire people to strengthen BC's food systems. So as we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm calling in today from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. The work that we do uh, promotes a food system that was not traditionally adopted by these nations. Uh, many communities still rely on their traditional food systems, and um, it's important that we integrate these environments into our agricultural systems and uh, continue to promote uh, the protection of these food systems as a part of the work that we do. Uh, we have a lot of people joining us today from across the province, so I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional caretakers of those lands, and I encourage everyone to uh, learn more about the history of the land that they're on um, and sort of what reconciliation looks like moving forward on that land. Um, we are joined by Shirlene from Earth Apple Organic Farm, a vegetable farm on the Glen Valley Organic Farm Cooperative in Abbotsford. And we are also joined by Heather from Northbrook Farm, a vegetable farm in Saanich, um, and also one of three farms involved in Saanich Organics. Um, so before we get started, um, I just want to let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on our website for later viewing. And um, we've also decided to add an additional 30 minutes to the webinar. Um, so from 7 to 7.30, uh, we can all take the opportunity to continue conversations around CSA planning. Um, this isn't meant to be a continuation of the question answer period of the webinar. Um, it's, um, it, we would just like to give extra time for information and resource sharing and kind of open it up for more of a group discussion amongst all of the farmers on the chat. So um, hopefully this will be a great opportunity to connect with other farmers on the call. Um, and so with all of that, I will pass it off to Heather to present. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I will, I'm just gonna start off by saying that I'm unfortunately, I will have to, to leave right at, at seven. I have another appointment that uh, was booked at that time. Um, so much as I'd love to hear more from you, uh, it'll have to be another time. Uh, and I am just going to jump right in because I know we want lots of time for um, Q and A's. So I'm going to screen share, which I'm not very practiced at doing, and I will just rely on um, to -do -do, screen broadcast. Um, I will rely on on Emily to um, to to let me know if anything's not going well. Uh, sorry, this took, took, took a minute last time too. Just took a second to, to connect. Um, I also won't be seeing what's in chat. So Emily, just, just please do jump in. Um, if anything is said in chat. Now, why? Yeah, absolutely. Did it take this long before? Uh, there we go. There we go. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> present on this device. Okay. Um, so this didn't start at the first slide. There we go. So uh, the Saanich Organics CSA. Now, when, when Emily was introducing me, um, uh, evidently I didn't give quite enough background about the Saanich Organics CSA. Saanich Organics is a business that's owned by three people, myself, Robin Tunnicliffe and Rachel Fisher. There's Robin. Um, so it's a three-person partnership, but uh, it, this, the CSA does also rely on, on a, little, a little help from our friends, as, as we say. Um, we don't grow all the produce that goes into our CSA. Uh, so little background. Uh, we, we took over the, the, the business, Sanit Organics, back in 2001. It was a very small CSA at the time run by two women who were uh, wonderful growers and mentors of ours. Um, they'd been running it for a few years and uh, just wanted, wanted, wanted a break from the admin. Uh, so they sold the, the business to us, us meeting Robin, Rachel and, and myself. And we had another partner at the, at the beginning um, because we had been selling to them, to their CSA. Uh, we are each of our farms were very very small so we didn't we didn't think that we that each of us could run our own successful csa 
we also didn't trust that we could eh, do a lot of our marketing on our own because yeah, each of us uh, was farming alone on very small parcels. So we teamed up, um, hired a, a very, very, very part-time administrator and started doing the CSA. That gradually evolved into our CSA fitting in with our other marketing streams. So uh, at, at that time, just one farmer's market, now two farmer's markets. And we started doing wholesale um, sales together as well. And now in recent years, we've two out of, well, actually we've all three added farm stands on our farms. Uh, Rachel's is only seasonal for, for plant starts and Robin and mine are for veggies. Uh, so with regards to this, our priorities of where our produce goes uh, sort of it changes with the seasons. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more on that later. So how do we fill our box? Um, we plan our box based on the, the retail value of the produce that's going in the box. So it's not uh, like a share of the harvest, so to speak. It's not like, oh, we have, look at that. We've got 85 heads of lettuce in this, in this bed. We're just gonna split it up. It's not that way. Instead, we know what the price of each item is. And so we put in $30 worth of produce into the box. Um, and then there's a $5 delivery charge. So $35 if the box is, is delivered, 30 if they pick it up from the farm. And then uh, the farmer doesn't get that whole price. So let's say, uh, let's use the, the, the example of a head of lettuce. I, as a farmer from Northbrook Farm, would get, oh gosh, Crystal, you'll have to, fat, you'll have to, I may get these numbers wrong. So forgive me, I don't, I don't have the, the, the price sheet in front of me, but let's just say I get $2 for a head of lettuce. Sanit Organics then marks that up 30% when it goes into our CSA. So the customer is paying $2.60 for that head of lettuce. I think it's a bit more than that this year. Anyway, um, but of course the, the customer doesn't know that the head of lettuce costs $2.60. They just see the box of produce and it, and it, it all adds up to, to $30 worth of produce. So our administrator, uh, Perry, plans out the box by, by seeing what's available and then choosing some leafy greens, some root, some fruit, some, and then something, whatever else, uh, something fluffy to, to fill up the box. And then our internal slang is a golden vibrator, which is the excite, whatever exciting crop that's going to look really good and make people excited to open the box that week. Um, so to back up then, how do we plan? Uh, to get ready to for our CSA. We used to have a very complex system of a big long meeting where we went through every crop that we could possibly grow and have a primary grower of that crop and a secondary grower of that crop. And um, over the years, partly because we have so many other marketing outlets for our produce, we wing it. Um, we let each other know if we're gonna do anything radically different. Um, radically different than previous years, but basically most of us grow most of the crops um, with, with a few exceptions. Some of us specialize in one thing or another, but uh, there's a lot of overlap in what we grow. Um, good communication is, is absolutely essential then because uh, you wanna make sure that, that there aren't misunderstandings um, festering. Um, you know, for example, this season, uh, <laughs> with the with COVID, um, we we knew our restaurant sales were going to absolutely plummet, so we decided to triple the capacity of our CSA, which turned out to be sort of great, but also more stressful than we anticipated. And um, after the fact, we realized that Robin, Rachel, and I, all three of us, thought it had been somebody else. The sort of talked all the way through. It was just that got tossed out and adopted. Um, we also didn't realize that one grower was um, was actually selling more to the CSA than she wanted to and, and was was really was really stressed about that. So good communication is is essential. Um, so we can we can slip into not uh, into letting our meetings slip uh, because we have been working together so long. Um, Robin and Rachel are, you know, two of my closest friends, and we've been working together for 20 years. Um, so you'd think we'd have this down. Well, we don't yet. It's still, it's still, 
we still let it slip and then remind ourselves, oh yeah, we have to keep those regular meetings to make sure we're not sort of taking things for granted. Uh, and then have contingency plans for when your crops fail. Um, don't worry, don't, or don't, don't, don't feel bad or embarrassed or anything. If, 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 especially in your first few years of your CSA, if you realize, oh crap, it's May. I thought I was going to have all these spring crops. They're not ready yet. Um, I'm in a pickle. Um, make sure you've talked to some other farmers first about what you'll do if, if, and when that happens or, um, because it happens to everybody. So the admin system of our CSA, um when we first when we started we were just doing it with spreadsheets and we had this system where you signed up to be a sanitary organics box customer and we assumed you were going to be a permanent customer um until you actually contacted us and quit uh, it wasn't a seasonal thing it was a year-round thing with it with a break in january um <laughs> that yeah that that didn't I mean, it worked, for, it worked okay, but sometimes people would be, you know, two or three boxes behind in their payment before we realized that they probably thought they'd quit and we didn't know. That was not good. Uh, then, so we tightened up our spreadsheets, um, tightened up our, 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 our accounts uh, receivable, so to speak. For a, while, for a few years, we tried uh, Farmigo um which had its advantages and disadvantages but ultimately we went back to spreadsheets it, it was it excel was simpler and at that time we simplified a lot and we switched to um people signing up for see for entire seasons under farmigo we allowed a lot of like you could come you could go you could put your box on hold you could come back um but we switched to just a, a little bit more of a traditional CSA where you sign up for the season. We have a season one, two, and three, and then a break in January. Um, you sign up for the whole season. You can choose every week, every second week. You can choose delivery or pickup, and that's it. Um, so our, our, our system is well, most of our complexity comes from the fact that the produce is coming from several farms. So there is a fair bit of administration in that way to know what's coming from whom and what the prices are and making sure everyone's paid appropriately. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, the only, the exception to this simple, simple season, for a few years there, we did a, what we called the winter abundance box. And I only mentioned this because it was kind of good. It was good marketing, good outreach, and it was a it was it was a, and it was a neat way to to sell a, kind of a bulk of produce at the at the end of the season before our, before our December January break, so people could sign up for either a fifty dollar box or a hundred dollar box. It it was produce that sold that, sorry that stored well, mostly uh, root crops, squash, garlic, and things like that, uh, and you did have to be a Sanitary Organics customer to get one. So people send those gifts and, and, um, and we got some new customers that way. That being said, it was, uh, it was a lot of admin to get all these new addresses and get people just one box. We didn't do it in 2020 because um, the pandemic met, demand, demand was so strong. We didn't really have that kind of excess produce to sell in December. Uh, almost done my time, so I'll just say uh, people, when you're hiring, when you're bringing people in, make sure you're hiring people who have different strengths than you. It's it's always it's always very tempting to hire people who you like so much because you click with them because they're exactly like you, but they might not. Then you might have gaps in your skill set. This is this is a picture of our our zucchini bake. Actually, no, it's not a zucchini bake off. We had a zucchini bake off every year for many years in a row, and then the, the, this year in the picture, we decided to do a beat off instead. <laughs> it was a beat. <laughs> the cooking contest um and the payoff uh, if you if you hire great people who are diverse and you treat them well um i just wanted to show off the cake that my farmhands made me one year that was awesome and then last last piece of advice here my time's up but remember the big picture uh always try to keep in mind the big picture of why you're doing what you're doing that may be different for each of you um for me it's as much about it's about food and it's about community. My community includes my customers and, but it also includes my, my, my business partners there and, and my family. Um, 
and 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 their families. So um, yeah, don't lose don't lose sight of the big picture. And that's that's it. That's a wrap. I'll try to figure out how to stop screen sharing now. <laughs> Thanks so much, Heather. You're welcome. It was great. I uh, I really like the idea uh -oh. of the winter abundance box. That's fantastic. Thank you. Wait a second. Oh, stop. Stop broadcasting. That's what I'm doing. There we go. <laughs> great. Um, so I'll just pass it right off to Shirlene if you uh, want to unmute, your, unmute yourself and uh, you can share your screen. Just to let everyone know, I will, um, I'm sort of taking note of the questions that come into the chat and I'm writing them down and I can just make sure to circle back and ask them all at the end. Great. Um, I'm a little bit concerned I have more slides than time here, so I'll do my best. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Shirlene from Earth Apple Organic Farm, and I was uh, hoping to tell you about uh, our two CSA programs that we run. Uh, just quickly about Earth Apple, um, established the business, the farm business in 2011, and moved to Glen Valley Organic Farm Co op in 2016, um, which is a big, beautiful 50 acre property on the west side of Abbotsford along the Fraser River and uh, cultivate six acres with my partner, Michael Nyberg, and also have a flock of about 300 laying hens. And um, we, over the years, have been trying to kind of reduce um, the number of logistics and hence some of our crops that we grow because I started off extremely ambitious and I've been trying to whittle it down over the years, which is why, yeah, planning um, for an efficient, uh, uh, CSA is, is really important. Um, but having said that, COVID kind of uh, threw things um, a little bit aside, and I ended up actually doing a little bit more <laughs> than usual. Um, so yeah, the two CSAs um, that, uh, well, there's a picture. Uh, we uh, participate in are the Glen Valley Organic Farm CSA. Um, which is a partnership business that we have with Close to Home Organics and a couple of other select local organic farms. And the other one is new as of last year. It's called the Farm Market CSA, which was inspired by COVID. Um, it was really just an extension of what we already do at farmers markets. And it was um, something we developed so that our customers could get their um, goodies without actually having to go into the market and line up and they could just grab pre-ordered things from behind the stall. So quickly try to run through each of those. Um, and within that, um, each of these sort of bullet points I have here, um, I'll kind of or sort of set the context of uh, how our planning takes place. So um, you can have a look at those. So the, I'll start with the Earth Apple Organic Farm Market. Um, this is basically developed because, uh, as I said, because of COVID, um, we were not really sure when all of that went down if uh, farmers markets were gonna stay open and then they were. And so this was sort of a, a creation that I came up with on the spot. The planning was done in March or April um, as opposed to what I usually do um, in the winter time where like, quite a bit of extensive planning goes, uh, happens. And instead it was just like, bing, bang, boom, I'm gonna learn how to use online software and uh, figure out a way for us to still get products to our farmer's market customers. Um, we were also sort of, uh, my partner and I interested in playing with the traditional model of a CSA. Um, and this was an opportunity to do that. Definitely um, allowed us to think outside the box. So as you'll see, the, um, the farm market CSA, which is the light green, is a very small portion of our overall revenue uh, that we count on, um, but it's part of our farmer's market revenue, which you can see is about 50% um, of what we expect in a year. And hopefully that will actually increase over time. Like I did no marketing, um, just sort of through, I had it on the website and some people signed up for it and it was more popular than I expected considering um, I really marketed it like not at all. 
So this, at the time that we were running it through 2020, only included our products. Um, one of the previous pictures I showed, uh, you'll see at the markets were called Farm Circle Organics. So we're part of a collective, not only um, in terms of the way we run our Glen Valley CSA, but also at farmers markets, we work with a small number of other farms so that we can help market each other's produce. Um, and so we decided like just for 2020 that this would only be available for our products, which I thought might be difficult, um, but turned out to be easy enough uh, because one of the other farms is fruit and it was pretty easy enough to just say, no, you can't add fruit onto your CSA. Um, learned how to use the Square Online Store, which is a free app. Uh, I found it to be pretty user-friendly. had to call in a few times to figure things out. It took a significant amount of time during the season, which was uh, unfortunate. Um, but it proved to be a really useful tool. And um, most of the members did actually pre-order so that they didn't have to enter the market um, and they could just grab their stuff from behind our stall. So I would basically update the products on the Tuesday. Um, people had to give their orders by Friday AM and then uh, we would pack the, the orders in the afternoon. Um, our harvest for market typically happens Thursday, Friday. So I might rearrange um, for the coming year, the, the days of uh, cutoff and um, when we print our orders off. Um, we only brought these to uh, the two markets we attend uh, on Saturdays, which are Riley Park and Trout Lake. Um, there's potential to expand that, uh, but um, also just sort of interested in keeping it as simple as possible at this point. We had a membership of a sliding scale of $350 to $1,000. So this has the benefit like most CSAs where you receive cash up front. Um, and this also gives an opportunity depending, like it, it has much more flexible for people in terms of if they wanted to contribute like a smaller amount for the year or if they do actually eat a lot of vegetables to be able to put in a larger amount. Um, and basically the way it worked is they just use up their, um, their account uh, that credit that they uh, committed to at the beginning of the year. If they decide $350, for example, wasn't enough, then they can also add credit later in the year. Um, I'm thinking of adding for this year as I'm planning this, uh, that we will have a minimum order. There was a couple of times where people would just order like two things, um, which is not a big deal, except that it is just another sheet to print and then another box to pack with like eggs and one tomato or something. Um, and so I think that would probably help if, if folks are thinking of doing it in this way. Uh, Square has these gift cards. They, um, we basically just use them as member cards instead. So they have an account number, they can sign in with that. Um, and then it tracks their credit automatically. And the value of the items we put in the box are just the same as the other market merchandise, which makes it nice and easy. Um, and we um, offered it obviously every week that we were at the market, which is every week, March through October. And that um, has worked really well so far. Um, if people don't use their credit up by the end of October, then they just can use it in the next year. So it kind of commits you in a way to um, having to go to farmer's markets year after year. Um, but we also encourage people to use it up as quickly as they can. I forget to hit start on my timer. I'll just pay attention. I might ask you to help me keep track of it. Um, in terms of the crop and harvest planning, it's really simple. Um, I don't need to go into it much here because it's basically what we have available for farmer's markets. Um, and because we're part of the collective and we might consider including other farms products in this market CSA, it's pretty well-rounded selection of items. Um, and we found that people typically ordered the same types of things every week anyways, um, and got a good idea of what they're looking for, which uh, has, has been what we already have available. Uh, some of the pros of just like other CSAs upfront cash and guaranteed revenue, um, potentially we're increasing customer attendance at farmers markets because people find this on the website and um, might not normally have gone to farmers markets and this is sort of an entrance point for them. Uh, there's the potential for increased sales because um, 
it's easy for them. They can think ahead. It's online. They can just pick and choose the things they want um, rather than search through it at the market, uh, which is kind of a little bit hectic now with um, the market managers constantly asking people to move on. Um, and also uh, just because we're getting customers essentially to commit to us rather than shopping around. Um, if it's a slow market, it increases traffic in the stall because they're coming weekly. They don't have to pre-order. They can just go into the stall and pick and choose. Um, kind of creates a buzz factor and helps to keep the energy up in our stall. And um, there's no need to make a separate delivery, which is a huge bonus. Uh, we're going to the market anyways. There's uh, less pressure in filling a specific box value each week, um, which I really like to have a little less stress any way I can. And members, like the pro to them is obviously they get to pick and choose what they receive. Um, in addition, we were able to specialize a little bit more. Um, and anytime you get to specialize, your efficiency and quality of product goes up. So um, other pros, sorry, there's quite a few, it turned out, um, get to see our members in person. Don't always get to do that when we drop off our boxes at certain hub points. Uh, there's no need to have a separate harvest plan. Um, members don't need to order pickup every week. It solves that vacation problem. So if they don't want um, produce that week, they don't have to. And members receive priority on certain limited quantity products. So we don't have very many raspberries that week. Um, the members that uh, order online usually get to grab them first before our farmer's market customers. Um, and yeah, option to pick up items without having to get in line with the farmer's market. Some of the cons include that the pickup is only on Saturday, um, which doesn't work for everybody. A selection is somewhat limited, um, but that can be improved by including the collective products. Uh, requires a minimum order um, so that we don't waste our admin time, which people might not prefer. And um, we're unable to control what people order. Um, I it's not a huge con. It sort of depends. Like there's been products that we've grown in the past that we grew out of interest more than demand, and this just sort of helps us in that way. Um, and we're currently using the free version of Square, which has its limits. Um, yeah. So in conclusion, I would say the pros definitely outweigh the cons. We're going to try it again, um, and yeah, there's potential for it to expand and get even better. So yeah, the next box that I'd like to, to talk about is more around the sort of traditional model of CSA. Um, and that's our Glen Valley Organic Farm Box, which we uh, do in partnership with Close to Home Organics. Um, we partnered with Close to Home in 2018. Um, we we're interested in sort of, the, Close to Home Organics is also on the Glen Valley organic farm co-op property. Um, we work side by side in lots of ways, although we're independent businesses. Um, and so it was a neat opportunity for us to work more closely together and share some of the um, overhead that um, we incur as businesses and doing things independently. So um, that was pretty exciting. We're moving into our, I guess, is it third or fourth season now? 18, 19, 20, 21. Yeah, fourth year together, working together. Um, and so there's definitely some value or some points that Heather brought up that are um, pretty important in terms of communication that I resonated with and working with other farmers. Um, so this is like our, I guess our value is that community is not just between the farmers and the consumers, but that it's amongst farmers as well. Uh, and in addition to working with one another, we also um, collaborate with uh, two or three other local organic farms uh, to help fill the box. Um, yeah, some of the same ideas are just increasing in efficiency of crop planning. Um, so we each get to grow uh, crops that we prefer to grow or that we do well or that work with our other market streams. Um, and that makes for a full box still, even though we're dividing it up. And so you can see that um, this traditional box that we've been doing is about 30% of our revenue. Both of us had been running our own CSA um, for quite a number of years. And so we put our customers together. And as a result, we obviously have um, yeah, a great advantage that way. And so it's a significant portion there. Um, so what we decided to do in 2018 is register as a partnership business with the CRA. 
Um, and we have a separate bank account and uh, a shared bank account rather that allows us to um, just keep things sort of tidy and separate from our own businesses. Uh, we don't share assets in the business. It's strictly just for the CSA that we have this business account. Um, and it's, the way it works is we essentially each subcontract, or this is the way we've been doing it so far, and we might change that, but we subcontract the labor we each hire in our own businesses um, to run the CSA. Um, we're considering actually hiring under the Glen Valley Organic Farm Business um, Partnership this year. Um, we just opened our CSA. You can check out the website to sort of see our prices and how we've uh, organized it. Uh, we had 215 members last year. Um, also, yeah, our CSA was increased significantly as a result of COVID. People were all of a sudden very interested uh, in the box um, and will likely float around that number again. It seemed to go really well. A lot of the um, things about the thing about running a CSA is that uh, if there's quite a few logistics and the number of logistics don't necessarily go up when your membership goes up. And so if you're going to commit to doing a CSA, I would suggest, yeah, that if you are capable of increasing your membership number, um, the only way it might increase your logistics is, is just through correspondence. Uh, and hopefully you shoot for people that are on side with you right from the get go and understand that you're not going to have a ton of time for for emailing back and forth. Um, so yeah, it was a good choice in the end to increase our membership. Um, we offer half shares and full shares. The half shares, the way we work it is that they just get a full box every other week so that we don't have to figure out how to cut a cabbage in half um, or a squash in half, etc. And uh, we also have have an online store option for members to add on to their box. Um, and as part of this, we also include other, like I said, other farms produce. So Snowy Mountain Organics also partnered with us, um, although they're not registered as a business with us. Um, and they provide uh, stone fruit throughout the season. Um, so people can add a fruit share. Um, they can add an egg share as well, uh, which we have the laying hens. Um, and the value of a box without the added stuff is just $40. And that includes um, uh, our delivery costs and our sort of bottom line value for products included. Some of the admin, we also charge an admin fee, uh, a one-time admin fee for members. Hey, Shirlene, sorry to jump in. I just wanted to let you know that um, we should probably wrap up in just, in just a couple of minutes. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Um, and in terms of planning, we do the majority of it through the winter. We're still doing lots of it right now. Um, we have regular meetings on Mondays through the season, um, which is really important for us to check in, not only in terms of what products are available, but just in terms of like delegation of tasks and other concerns that might be arising. Um, the harvest plan, which I'm actually currently working on for, um, for our CSA, is, de is predetermined in lots of ways, although we also understand um, that flexibility is required because things don't always work out the way you plan them to. Um, but it definitely helps us to know what we're shooting for. And we use Farmago, uh, which is all in one software program. It's a little bit uh, pricey, but um, it covers much of the required um, services that are, are involved in running a CSA. So this is one week of the um, harvest plan for the CSA. An example, I've got a column for what actually went in the box in 2020. This column was 2019. And then this is sort of the plan for 2021. Um, this is an updated, I haven't actually worked on it yet. It still says 2020 here. Um, and that helps us also divide the box uh, in terms of what, which um, business is getting what value for their products. Um, and it just shows our agreed upon prices. Um, yeah, it helps lots. Um, the, basically, the only thing we share um, is the actual packing and delivery and administrative duties. Uh, any harvest and prep of products is done um, by each of the businesses beforehand. Um, and we have a 50% markup um, like for each of us. and. If that covers our admin costs, great, or our overhead, that's great. If it's um, a little bit more than we needed, then we split the profit. Um, 
All right, crop and harvest planning. So I think we strive for about 50-50 product input between the two partnership businesses. Um, but uh, it doesn't always work out perfectly. It seems to be pretty darn close year after year though. Um, and if there's crops we don't want to grow, like we have club root on our farm now, so we outsource uh, to other farms uh, for broccoli or cabbage or whatnot. Um, this is a box going into the back of the truck. Lots of our products can't be refrigerated. We often pack the day before delivery, put them in the fridge so it's ready to go. And then the morning of, we put in any last minute products um, like tomatoes and basil that shouldn't be refrigerated. Um, pros, upfront cash and guaranteed revenue, same as the other one. Uh, shared crop plan allows each of our farm businesses to increase our efficiencies in terms of the number of crops uh, we're required to grow. Um, thus, the quality and expertise for certain crops is increased. And when that happens, the, we have better member retention. Um, people come back year after year. Um, relieves the stress of filling a box by ourselves each week. Um, really great to work with other people in that regard. And if crop failures on the part of one farm happens, it can be helped by another. And also our pest control issues are managed better in the fields as a result. Um, they've proven to be diverse um, by work, working collaboratively. Um, and yeah, it's just nice to share some of the overhead and the uh, expenses that go into it. Um, if one of the businesses gets sick or injured, um, it's not as big of a concern. The show can go on um, by another business stepping in more and uh, it increases our marketing by way of each of us um, doing our own marketing. Um, and it strengthens the ties between all of us farmers. Sometimes, sometimes we, we don't get along and we have to figure it out, <laughs> which also strengthens our ties. Um, this is sort of us packing, um, getting ready for loading all the boxes into the fridge. Cons, um, we must still grow a fairly large diversity of products. Lots of farms strive to reduce the number of products they're growing to increase efficiency, but we still have to grow quite a diversity. Um, running a CSA is a fairly large and involved administrative process. Um, and a lot of people uh, have chosen that I know other farm friends have chosen not to run it as for that reason, especially if they're heading towards wholesale, they're trying to reduce the number of crops they grow and the amount of administrative work they do. They just wanna grow food. Um, and then the error margin tends to increase with the number of members you, if you increase your CSA membership. It's just uh, the way it goes. So somebody doesn't get their box um, or somebody didn't get zucchini in their box and they complain about it and you can't believe it. So in conclusion, um, <laughs> Um, I would say again, the pros outweigh the cons for us. Uh, collective effort has proven to be successful for um, three seasons now. And working with other farms, as Heather said, absolutely requires really good communication. Um, just build that into your weekly plan that you have meetings and um, make an effort to, um, yeah, to, to make sure that all the agreements are in place. Everybody understands the process and pricing, um, who's doing what, et cetera. Uh, and yeah, good luck. I see lots of people in the feed um, are thinking of starting one or starting their market garden. And um, yeah, I've been running a CSA for, I guess, 10 years now. And um, yeah, I'm still doing it. So it's definitely worthwhile. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Charlene. So um, you can, I mean, you can definitely, well, you can maybe feel free to and, um, stop sharing your screen if you'd like, um, although this is a lovely photo of you. Um, <laughs> there we go, we can see everybody again. Um, so I just, I was kind of jotting down questions and I know there's been back and forth in the chat and there's been, a, you know, a couple that have been answered, but I think I'll just go through them again anyway, um, just in case anybody missed some of the, what was going on in the chat. Um, so one of the first questions um, from someone was, um, is the farmer price um, the price that you'd get at the market? And I think that was in um, a question to Heather when you were talking, yeah. Um, uh, no, uh, what I mean by farmer price is like the, um, yeah, the price that I as Northbrook Farm get, um, which is lower than, so that, that it's more like the, the price that, that customers pay in the box is more parallel to the price they would pay at market. 
Um, because you got to remember when you go in a farmer's market, like that's also, that's also work. That's also not free. Right. So, so let's say, um, uh, let me, let me say three, let me, well, I'll, I'll use that $2 head of lettuce example again, although I re realize that price is too low. It's not that low, but anyway, let's say Northbrook farm gets $2 when I sell it to the CSA and, you know, $3 if I sell it at the market, but that, you know, that required my table fees, my time at the market, my, you know, all, all of that as well. So I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. um, Charlene, did you have anything to add just to to that question? Yeah, I, in terms of setting price, is mm -hmm. that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would uh, echo, I guess, what Heather said. I think it's really important that you don't ever undervalue your products because yeah, it's more than just growing food and not just growing, like if you're doing a CSA, you're going quite a diversity of foods. Uh, a lot of farms only grow like three to 10 crops. Um, and so there's added value in that sense too, that you're becoming an expert on all of a sudden a huge diversity of, of products. Um, and that, you know, you're doing that so that you can get your product direct to customer. And so there's no middle people um, and they understand exactly where their, their products are coming from. So that bottom line, that sort of like um, wholesale price, if you will, should be slightly higher than when, if you were selling it to a distributor, for example. And then, yeah, there's a lot of work involved in running a CSA. So make sure that's built into the cost. Awesome, thanks. Uh, and uh, someone was curious to know more about the zucchini and beet, uh, the beet bake-offs. <laughs> yeah, I think it was super simple. It just started kind of as a joke one year um, where we had a glut of zucchini and, um, and yeah, it started as a joke and it caught on just all the staff from all our farms are invited uh, one day to come, come over here and bring, it could be any, it could be savory, it could be sweet, it could be anything. And then we, uh, we try to judge uh, all the entries on a whole bunch of different categories um, so that we can give away lots of prizes. So the goal is like almost everybody. And of course the prizes are not very valuable, but you know, Robin, Rachel and I buy the prizes and you know, everybody eats a bunch of stuff and votes on things and it's fun. That's all, it's just fun. It, it sounds like a lot of fun. Um, uh, the next question was, um, and I saw that you had um, kind of answered it, it a little bit in the chat as well, but do you have any standardized quality or packing size standards in place um, between the three farms, uh, or in your case, I guess, Trillian, um, two farms uh, between, or so that the customer experience is more consistent? If you don't mind, Charlene, I'll, I'll take that first. Yes, so, size isn't necessarily consistent because uh, as I say, it all goes back to values. So when our administrator, Perry, is planning what's gonna go into the box, it may help him out to realize, oh, I should put in three quarters of a pound of zucchini where the next week he might put in two pounds, um, just depending on what else is going in the box and how the dollar value works out. So sizes aren't consistent. Um, but he, then when he's ordering from me, he'll say, you know, I need one pound bunches of this, three quarter pound bunches of that. Um, generally, you know, they're mostly usually a bunch of beets is a pound, usually a bunch of chard is a half pound, but, but that can be flexible to get the value right in the box. Uh, quality standards, we just have to keep communicating well. Um, any of us can, can, can goof uh, on any given day when you're tired and you, and you whatever, um, that crop was more damaged than you thought. So we just, the deal is, you know, if, if somebody sees something in, in, in my crop that isn't as good as it ought to be, they tell me and I don't get offended. Um, and we just sort of keep, keep tabs on each other that way. Um, yeah, I, we, um, we try to stay as consistent as possible, but um, like in terms of even w within one week for the boxes, it uh, doesn't always turn out that um, every, you know, winter squash, for example, is exactly the same size. Um, and so we try to correct as we're packing essentially when that happens. So this person got um, a big squash and then, well, let's give them like a slightly smaller tomato or, 
you know, it, we figure it just all balances out by the end of the season after like 26 weeks or whatever of produce. Um, week to week, we typically try, strive to keep things about the same amount. So one pound bunch of carrots is pretty much the case throughout the entire season. Um, the only time that might not be the case is if for some reason we were low and we had to give them two bunches of carrots instead, um, but still they're one pound bunches. Um, yeah, and we've also found just sort of a related note uh, that there's certain products that people either want uh, a lot of, like potatoes, for example, if you give them one pound of potatoes, it's really not that much. Uh, and so we usually give them uh, two pounds of potatoes now and then try not to do certain things every week because they'll get tired of them. Um, so that's, yeah, been, and we always do a survey at the end of our CSA season to get feedback so that we can improve it for the next season. Great, thanks. Um, and how many products do you have in your online store and how long did it take uh, to update those products to your store? Uh, uh, because we use the Pharmago program, it doesn't take too much time. Um, typically, we've had, um, similar to Sanich, uh, administration, administrative person that helps us manage that aspect of things. And so um, that person was Eric for the past couple of years. And so we just basically updated him in our Monday meetings about what we have available to go on the store. And then he goes and updates those, um, trying as much to keep um, units consistent so that there's not a lot of updating in the store. Um, price is consistent, but sometimes, you know, we'll change the quantity of something like make a bulk box of blueberries, for example, instead of a pint. Um, and so, yeah, it doesn't take a lot of extra time. It's kind of a nice bonus for people to be able to expand their box if they want to, or add things like cilantro, which we don't ever put uh, in all of our 200 boxes. We'll get like half of them complaining to us that it ruined the taste of everything else in their box. Um, and so it just helps. Yeah. And then also just helps us move some products. We don't have 200 quantities of, um, but we have a little bit of it. So yeah, it's been, it's been great. Wow. We've never had a complaint about cilantro and we put it in like oh, really? fairly, fairly regularly. Interesting. <laughs> I feel like that's a genetic thing. I've heard that some people, just, yeah, me too. I guess, I guess our, uh, over here on the Island, people just suck it up. If they don't <laughs> like it, they just, I don't know. <laughs> straight into the compost or give it to their neighbor, but they don't, uh, yeah, haven't had complaints. That's good. Um, and this was a question, um, and again, it's been uh, semi-answered, I think, um, but uh, it says for earth apple, what do you have to do uh, that allows you to sell your food? For example, soil testing, and I can see Mike, um, you sort of responded already um, in that you're certified organic. Um, and then there's certain gu guidelines that you have to follow through that and that soil testing is a big part of it as well as uh, business insurance. But I just thought I'd put it out there to see if, Shirlene, you wanted to add anything or if, Heather, you had any insights on that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, there's really no guidelines to be able to sell food that I'm aware of. Um, there's lots of food safety programs that you can participate in. It really depends who you're selling too, if you're selling to grocery stores and you do have to go through a process of food safety certification. Um, for certified organic, uh, yeah, we're, as Mike indicated, we're, uh, so we're certified through the BC Association for Regenerative Agriculture. Um, and uh, Glen Valley has been certified um, for many years before I joined. So I was lucky enough to be able to just join in on an already established um, history of, of good results. Um, and yeah, so we're audited every year by them. Um, so that keeps us in check in terms of organic standards. And other than that, I've um, always sold direct and haven't had to do anything, um, but also have done food safety courses. It's definitely a valuable thing to learn, uh, especially if you're gonna be dealing with any products that are a bit more sensitive, like um, salad greens or microgreens or those types of things. Yeah, I also, um, we are, we're all certified organic. Um, that's near and dear to my heart. My other, my volunteer work is, is in the organic community. Um, and we only, so as I said, we, we do buy produce from other farms to especially shoulder seasons. And anyway, and a sandwich organics policy, we, we, we do buy from farms that are, that are in transition to organic. If they've 
if they've um, you know applied to certify and have have been inspected at least once, uh, we it's very important to us to support um, farms transitioning to organic. But um, but we don't buy produce from anyone who just says, oh yeah, my 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 practices are the same because we we we're not in the business of inspecting other people's farms. So we 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 only sell certified or in transition to certified organic produce. And, and we don't have any other sort of certifications or food safety um, tr training, except just having taken food safety courses. Mm. Um, and how, how do you handle member dropouts or credits that remain at the end of the season? This was a, a specifically directed towards um, Shirlene, but I think, either, I think both of you could, could definitely touch on this. I'm going to take it uh, first, just because my answer is really quick. We don't have that anymore. We used to when we when we did have Farmigo and and allowed people to come and go. But now it's like you sign up, you pay in advance before the season starts. Um, a couple people each season. Um, you know, we had sadly we had an elderly customer die last year. Obviously, we, we refunded their family. Um, and other than that, uh, or and once in a while, somebody will move away. It's just case by case, but people have paid in advance for the whole season. So there's no, there's no dropouts. Uh, similar, uh, we, we, like, unless there was extenuating circumstances, wouldn't, um, refund anybody if they bought a share of, uh, um, the season from us. Um, in terms of credit that we do actually have a vacation policy where if, uh, I can't remember it exactly. I think it's listed on our website, but I think it's if you have one or two vacations, um, uh, we will credit after that, you don't receive credit. And that just works mostly through just being able to purchase additional things on the online store. Um, or uh, at the end of the previous season that we just had, we actually had a, we did, one person had quite a bit of credit. Um, and so we just put up a, put together a big sort of winter box for them um, at the end of the season. Great, thanks. And um, from both of your experiences, is there one prominent thing that you've done that really gets people talking about your CSA? For example, like a farm event or a contest or a draw, maybe like a weekly newsletter? Do you wanna go first, Shirley? Uh, we do send out a weekly newsletter. It has recipes and updates um, about sort of what each farm business is up to and what the fields look like. Um, definitely helps um, people sort of understand um, and connect with sort of the everyday ins and outs of farming. So we flooded in the middle of the summer in 2020 um, pretty severely. And so it was nice to be able to share that with folks um, so they can get a good idea of um, like what they're committing to by being a CSA member. Uh, I think that's a pretty important component, I guess, of, of running a program is that the education aspect of things. Um, and so I think that's mostly, we have had lots of um, tours in the past. This year, we didn't do that, um, but it's usually an open house day where members are able to come out, um, have a picnic. Um, we do tours of the field and talk a little bit about what we do in farming. Uh, and for Sanit Organics, um, oh, I don't know, years and years ago, Rob and Rachel and I wrote a book that was handy. Um, oh, promo, all the dirt, uh, Reflections on Organic Farming. Um, and my partner, Robin, is pretty, uh, she's pretty outgoing and does quite a bit of, she teaches workshops at, um, that's handy, yeah, workshops at CD Saturdays. Um, and just and being at the market too, I feel like sort of gets our our, our names and our faces out there. Um, and and word of mouth, I'd say, is 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 the primary thing. Social media, we keep trying and not being very good at it. Um, all right, thank you for that. And um, I'm just a lot of questions have come in now, which is awesome. Um, is there a resource available anywhere that gives standard or standard sizes of items in CSA boxes? Um, kind of like you were saying, like, for example, a bunch of beets is one pound. Um, yeah. Do you know of any of resources that share information? Uh, 
that sort of like provides a unit for yeah uh, not that i'm aware of but no me neither sounds like a good idea though maybe <laughs> yeah definitely i mean it'd be neat to um be able to share resources uh with people starting a csa um in terms of yeah the type like because it's just taken years for us anyways to figure out what the around right amount of something is to put in a box that people will be happy with mm -hmm. um do either of you have any tips to increase the efficiency of administration and to simplify the process in the office um is there a program set of spreadsheets that you've used to stay organized i believe you guys are doing a webinar on that soon <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true yes thank you for that plug we are doing a webinar yeah um, I think that's a big part of it is just um, becoming familiar with the different software programs that are available that help um, having a person that specifically does administrative work is important and I know like because I've always done it myself up until we hired Eric to do it for the Glen Valley CSA and having somebody um, responsible for that aspect of it just was such a huge load off my back I like I still rejoice in that feeling um having done it for a few years without uh having to do it myself it's pretty great um in terms of efficiencies like just have your sort of like rules in place and stick to them and don't shift things as you go remember you're providing a really valuable product and you kind of want members on board that are in agreement with um how you run the program just pick and choose your customers to some extent uh, and make sure they're they're supportive um of, of how you do things and that they're happy with the way you've set things up. I, I think that's great advice, Charlene. And I think that it, like, if you can, if you're at a farmer's market as well, or if you can have a farm stand at your farm in addition or something like that, when people are interested in your CSA, but say, but seem like they're going to need more, um, more customization, then, it, then you, you have an option instead of just saying, no, we're not for you. You can say, please shop at our, at our farmer's market table or please come to our farm stand on the one day a week it's open or whatever. Uh, Cause you can't be everything to everyone. We used to way back in the day, we had a policy where um, we said you can't substitute items week by week, but cause we don't exactly know what's gonna be in the box, but um, customers could tell us in advance, like I never want X, like I, whatever, I hate broccoli. I never want broccoli. And then we could we could choose you know a substitution for that item, which we thought sounded simple, and we realized that those few customers who had their like dislikes on file, just caused us no end of headaches. We kept screwing it up, and we kept forgetting and forgetting to or to get one extra of the carrots that we were going to sub for the broccoli or whatever. And we realized that a small percentage of our customers were taking a disproportionate amount of our admin time. And so that's not fair to, the, to everybody else, right? Because the, the, the admin cost is spread out evenly over the boxes. So um, gradually over the years, we've gotten less and less um, customizable. And now it's like, this is our CSA, take it or leave it. And we use base, basically we use Excel spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. And, and we do, but we have a really nice, happy newsletter and, you know, we're nice <laughs> and our food's really, really good, but it's not customizable. Mm -hmm. um, someone actually just asked, how much do you hate washing CSA bins <laughs> or bins for CSAs? <laughs> yeah. We use, we actually use wooden boxes, um, custom, oh, okay. custom made wooden boxes with our name and, and, and uh, phone number stenciled on the side. And um, we use, they fit uh, like a, a beer flat really nicely in the bottom. So we, we use cardboard beer flats in the bottom that we change out sometimes. And, um, and then we sometimes line them with, with paper if they're getting grungy and we don't have enough clean beer flats around, but um, the wood, it's just, it's just wood and um, yeah, works pretty well. It's um, I'll just backtrack to the previous question quickly. Another thought I had that kind of makes our logistics and administrative part um, a bit more tedious um, that we could potentially avoid is by having rotational crops. So if, for example, like one of our crops didn't work out that great, um, like we got blight on our tomatoes, for example, uh, last year, 
And so um, we didn't have enough to put tomatoes in all the boxes one week. And so we put them on rotation, which means we had to write down which boxes received the tomatoes so that the next week um, we could make sure that the boxes that didn't receive them get them, which when you have um, half box shares that only run every other week and then different locations, it's quite, um, quite a task to keep track of. So as much as possible, try to keep the types of things you, you do on rotation limited and that will relieve some of the stress. Um, and yeah, nobody really likes washing the totes. It's just um, something that you plow through. We have a pressure washer. It's fun to use a pressure washer. Uh, and so that helps a little bit, but you know, we do over 200 totes every week that have to be sanitized and cleaned. So uh, especially with COVID, we were even more diligent about how we treated the boxes. So um, yeah, it's not, we're potentially looking at um, a washer that would do that for us. We can't really see how it will decrease the amount of time it takes, but it might make it a little bit more ergonomic and easier to, to move through. Yeah, definitely. Um, I can see here that we are just past seven. So I just, I know Heather, you do have to go. So, um, yeah. so I just want to, um, quickly before you do go, I just want to thank you both for joining us and for presenting on uh, your CSA programs. Uh, it's, it's really great. And I'm really, really grateful that you're able to share all of your knowledge and um, information with us. And, um, and then I think um, now that it is 7 p.m., we can, we can just open it up to more general discussion. Um, feel free to use this opportunity to share your experience operating a CSA, any questions you might have for the rest of the farmers in the webinar, um, if, if you have any great resources or information to share, that would be fantastic. And um, yeah, like if, feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions and sort of, we can kind of open it up to a general discussion. And I'm, I'll say, I'm sorry, I have to leave. And thank you all so much for being here. This was fun. And um, thanks, especially to Emily for organizing. And about resources, I saw somebody in the chat mention the COABC conference. Um, I'm on the board of COABC, so I'm going to put in a plug for that. It's uh, the podcast series leading up to the virtual conference is really, really good. So I encourage you all to go to uh, to check that out, the COABC Organic BC, uh, BC Organic Conference. All right. Thank you all. Bye. Bye, Heather. Bye. Yeah, so I know, I know we've been plugging questions into the chat you know, up until now, but, um, but do feel free to un unmute yourself. And if you have any further questions for everybody or something you'd like to share, or um, you can also continue to, to use the chat if you'd like. Jacqueline, what do you think of washing totes? <laughs> I hate it so much. 